happened last week, we got a comment uh, on, I think it was Instagram, about the Star of David. And that's why I chose this background in back of me a little bit. This is the Ephraim International. Boy, I've got a fly going. Live in the country, right? Um, but this is the Ephraim International background, okay? This is one that was this symbol, and we'll explain a little more at the end, uh, is one that Prophet Steve had been given uh, during a time of prayer, and uh, he held on to it for many, many years. And one day, he knew then why. And we'll go through all of this, like I say, at the end, so stick with me. But we had a comment, and it's been done before, that the Star of David, and we'll look at Acts, we'll look at Amos, that that was actually a pagan sign, and that it was the star of Moloch and Remphen, which are Saturn worship, uh, pagan gods, and we don't want to have anything to do with those. So a lot of a lot of well-meaning Christians will say you're you're glorifying the devil having that that symbol. And I want to go through some of that and debunk a lot of things and to show the origins of the Star of David, the Mugan David, right? And let's do that. Let me share screen here. So the Star of David, the truth be behind the icon. Sec Acts 7.43. You took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of your god, Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. There's a warning here. Now, this was Stephen uh, when they drug him out, and he was on his famous rant. Yeah, today we'd call it a rant, right? He was preaching and stirring up the crowd and really putting it right to the religious leaders. Now, in Amos, oops, let me move this guy out of the way. In Amos 5.26, which is exactly what Stephen was referring to, in, start in verse 25, you have offered sacrifices and offerings to me for 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel, but you have borne Sikoth, your king, and Chayun, your images, the star of your God. Now, those were Babylonian deities, all right, which you made for yourselves. That's important. Therefore, I shall cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God of hosts. Yahweh Se Sevaot, right? So that is what Stephen was coming at him. We know that Yeshua even came at the religious rulers. We see it in, uh, I believe it was John, John 8, John 9. You can look it up, but he was pouring it right to him, said, even down to the point where he said, okay, guys, you are of your father, the devil. You're not of Abraham. And that really got him st stirred up. And they wanted to stone and kill Yeshua right then. From, from then on out, it was cemented. They had it in for him. So we know that the religious crowd was not right. Stephen was picking it up even after they crucified Christ for saying basically the same thing. Here's Stephen saying, you're still off. You are idol worshipers. You're not worshipers of the one true God. And that got him killed as well. Now here is the full text there that we'll read in Acts, starting at 35. This Moses, whom you rejected when they, when they said, who appointed you leader and judge? God has also sent this leader and redeemer accompanied by the hand of the angel of the one who sent him by the bush. He led them out after he made wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, then in the Red Sea and the wilderness for 40 years. 
This is Moses, the one who said to the children of Israel, God will raise a prophet for you from your brothers as he did me. And here Stephen's talking about the Messiah being foretold by Moses coming into the nation of Israel. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to in Mount Sinai, sorry, and with our fathers who took living words to give us, to which our fathers did not want to become obedient, but they rejected them. And that's where we get into the problem. They rejected the word and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. We're going to again see a repeating theme. 40, when they said to Aaron, you must make us now gods for us who will go on before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. He was up on the mountain, right? 40 days. He disappeared into the cloud. They didn't know whether he was alive, dead. Did he abandon them? What was going on? So they turned back as a pig to his wallow. They went back to the gods of Egypt. And this is important to lay this groundwork as Stephen did. <clears throat> and they made a calf in those days. Let me get this up out of the way. They made a calf in those days and they brought an offering to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their hands. Now that never works out real well for anybody. And God turned away and gave them over to serve the host of the sky. That's an important little key note there that, that uh, Stephen let us in on, just as it has been written in the scroll of the prophets. Now, if you want to read that full chapter and what went on there, uh, it, it's, it's a good background for what we're going to go into. Now. The Star of David is not exclusively a Jewish symbol. We're going to see a few other things here. And this is the problem that we get into is that just as the rainbow is not exclusively a sign, uh, guess what? You know, the rainbow things are all over from selling kids candies, you know, Skittles, the rainbow, to the alphabet soup crowd to whatever. It's all over the place. Same thing with this star, all right? This star appears in other cultures and religions, practices dating back hundreds of years before the birth of Messiah. The six-pointed hexagram star is used in Buddhism, Freemasonry, Hinduism, Kabbalah, the occult, Saturn worship, and witchcraft. The six-pointed star, the hexagram, has been used as a talisman for conjuring up spirits in satanic occult magic. It's called uh, um, divine geometry, and there's a lot of them, the Freemasons, everything else. Yeah, you know what? It's all over the place. Does that mean it's good or bad? I mean, look at here. This is a symbol, and look what's up on top of the, the Dagon fish hat that the old boys got here. That came out of Babylon. We've got a symbol here that have Star of David. We've got a symbol here, Christian symbol. Are they good? Are they bad? I think it comes down to a couple of things. We're going to get into that. Here's where it gets into it. Now, did the old boys way, way back know that this is a picture, this is what they would find on the North Pole of Saturn? Now, mind you, each one of these sides here, and it's wild how that happens, but each one of these sides, to give you an idea how big this is, is the, bigger than the circumference of the Earth. This thing is enormous. But this is where we get into some of the Saturn worshipers 
and why they're using that hexagram to do it. Now, as we go on and look, it's not just there. Look at this. Interestingly enough, it shows up in our dollar, U.S. dollar bills. And here they put in the triangles for, for accent. But doesn't that look like what we just saw at the North Pole of Saturn? Is there something going on? 16 five-pointed stars representing the 13 original colonies in that six-pointed hexagram. Oddly enough, looking just like Saturn. Is there a hidden meaning? There might be. We know there was a lot of uh, Freemasons that were part of the founding of the corporation of the United States. That's all I'm going to say about that. Some will even say that the sign is of the Antichrist. If you look at it, it's kind of like uh, Prophet Steve one time uh, talked about carbon uh, and the sign of a man being 666 because of the, the periodic table. Here again, we see it coming up here. Here's all the math added up. Uh, it comes up to 666, and somebody will say, that's it. That's enough for me. It's got to be the sign of the Antichrist. Well, it might be. It might not be. Hinduism. Look at here. This has been for centuries, and before Christianity, they had this. Uh, this is to show the duality nature of their deity. Uh, Shiva was one of them, Sikara, something like that. The male and the female, the yin yang whole deal. Uh, that's what this symbol is in Hinduism. Looks a lot like uh, the Star of David, doesn't it? But it's not. What that means to them is totally different than what the Star of David means to us. How about this one? How about this one? This is a six pointed star. You know, the question stands, I guess, is that satanic or not? Should they be wearing a six-pointed star? Is the government trying to tell us they're run by a cult? No, I don't know. Why did they choose a six-pointed star? Who knows? I guess if you did a lot of digging, you can do. I just want to make a point here that just because it's a star does not mean it's from the pits of hell. Important note, the Jewish star referred to as the Star of David, Shield of David, Seal of Solomon, uh, the Muggen David, if you will, is a six-pointed hexagram star comprised of two overlaying triangles, all right? There's a lot of things that it's a Jewish icon. It identifies the nation of Israel. There's no scripture reference, and this is key. No scripture reference of the Star of David, the Shield of David, the Seal of Solomon. The Main Street Judaism acknowledges that they don't know where the Star of David symbol originated. That's important. It wasn't like there was premeditated. You can say, ah, oh, Satan creeped in and gave us the star of David to throw us off. I don't know. Nobody knows. At this point, if, if, if the Jews don't even know, then what do you got going? There's no scriptural command, the other important note, or something that designates a star as a symbol of the nation of Israel. Now, we've got the circumcision that's a sign. We've got the Sabbath that's a sign. We've got the rainbow that was a sign. We've got the seal of the covenant that's a sign. We're going to have other signs, a seal in our forehead eventually that's a sign, but nothing that says you will take this star. We've got the, the, the tzitzi, okay, if you can see these little guys here hanging, the tzitzi the four corners of our garment, that's a sign that's commanded, 
but there is no sign to take a star. So you've got to understand that. Just like when we get into some of these things where uh, uh, is the new moon a Sabbath? Some will say, absolutely, it's a Sabbath, but nowhere in scripture does it say that you shall rest on your new moon. It is not a Sabbath or a Sabbaton. So is it wrong to celebrate, treat it as a Sabbath? No. Is it wrong if you go to work or do something on a new moon? No. There's only one new moon, I guess just to clear that up, there's only one new moon that is commanded as a Sabbaton, a Sabbath-like event, and that is on the Feast of Trumpets, where that new moon and that feast day line up perfectly. That is the only time that a new moon is a Sabbaton. So for what, what that's worth. But that gets into it. When you start reading things into other than what is presented clearly in scripture, I mean, God could have, look, God could have clearly, if he wanted us <clears throat> to have a star as a sign, then he would have absolutely run it up. The same time he was talking about the, the talit and the, the tzitzi on our garments, he would have said, oh, by the way, you'll put also a star. And this is what I want you to do. He didn't do that. Just like with the new moon, he could have said, and in your new moons at the beginning of months, you shall observe a Sabbath of rest. You shall do no. It's not there, is it, guys? So, so let's kick that one. I guess I kicked over that sacred cow for you. Now, who do we see? We do see this in Torah. Let me back up. We do see this in Torah. Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5. Thou shalt not make thee unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them nor serve them. Does this mean all images are forbidden or evil? That's the question we've got to look at. Now we've got to go to scripture to validate that hypothesis, that question. You can use the scientific method on scripture and it will prove itself out. Problem is a lot of people take things out of context, context and they'll run with them without running it through the process. Example of images commanded in Torah. And God commanded Moses to have cherubim sculpted for the sides of the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, these two cherubims were to be located in the Holy of Holies, just the place one would su suspect idolatry. They could real easily start worshiping the cherubims instead of the God that sat on the seat. Now, God had Moses cast a serpent out of brass. They finished this. The, the finished sculptor was to be elevated on a pole for the people to look up to. Again, this seems like an open invitation to idolatry. You know, you got the snake worshipers or something would come out of that. And in fact, some of the, the Pentecostals that were dancing with stakes and how many people got bit, got sick, got killed uh, because they were testing their faith. Look at uh, the last one. The serpent also became a symbol of God's power to forgive and remove judgment. Christ extends this specific metaphor to a universal one when he compares his own crucifixion to the brass serpent. And there's the scripture reference. So are these icons bad? Even Yeshua turned to that snake in the wilderness and said, I'm just like that. Okay. Good or bad? Here's some other examples. 
the tablets of stones that had the Ten Commandments. God put them, carved them. They were a graven image. Do you understand that? Those tablets of stone were graven images. Just saying. Aaron's rod that budded. That was kept and put in the Ark of the Covenant as a memorial. The menorah that was crafted. The Ark of the Covenant itself with the angel, the cherubs, and, and all the ornate gold that was in there. The temple. The temple itself was an icon, a commanded. that was a focal point of the worship system. The rainbow, we talked about that. The Pesach, how about that? There's an image. The Pesach. The golden laver. And we'll get into that one in a minute. That one's interesting when you think about that one. And here's something to con consider. Another example of the re relationship between subject matter and content. And this is crucial to what we're getting with, with uh, the Star of David. While Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the law, Aaron succumbed to public pressure and cast a calf. Perhaps in his own mind, he really believed that the form didn't matter as long as the name was right. He called, he called it Jehovah. The people instinctively responded in ways that didn't please Jehovah at all, demonstrating their understanding that something more than a form had changed. When Aaron was confronted with his failure, he gave the fantastic excuse and there came out of this calf. He said, something, when I got it done, it took the people over. Something came out of the calf. Well, yeah, I'll bet it did. You and I know what that is, a familiar spirit. Uh, once he got the little whisper to do that and to form it, and where did they get that? Back in Egypt. They went back to some of the gods that, that were prevalent there. Was there something about a sculpture of a calf that was evil? Not really. For later example of the same subject illustrates a crucial difference. Solomon was commanded to make a brazen basin for cleaning the priests. It was a washing basin. It was supported on the hindquarters of 12 oxen. You can look up there in 2 Chronicles 4.4. 4. The animal is the same, but the meaning is quite different. Aaron's calf stood on its own pedestal with all the attention focused to it. The oxen serve as support for the brazen sea. They are the servants helping to perform the Lord's work. The image was the same. The content was the opposite. Do you ever consider that? And then there's this, the seal of the state of Israel to this day, this is what you'll find. When you look on an official flag, an official seal, the menorah, the menorah is absolutely an individual work. When you look at that, you would think that is what we should have focus on. Why doesn't everything that identifies the Jewish people a menorah? Because the menorah is a one of a kind. And here, you know, when you look at the meaning of, of this seal, the menorah, of course, going back to the temple, back to the focus of what's going on. We've got the, the olive branches on both sides that Israel's looking for peace. And then at the bottom, that says Israel. Now, some have suggested, I think it was Lou White in a couple of books that he did, uh, suggested that the star is actually a brand from the shield of David in Paleo-Hebrew. Now, when you go back before the Babylonian diaspora, 
the Paleo Hebrew, and here's a good, this is just a little snippet of it to give you an idea, is much different than the modern day Babylonian Hebrew that we have today. And the D right here, Dalet, is much different than we see it today. Today, that Dalet is this over here, but back then it was a triangle. Okay. So could it have been, as, as Lou suggested, <clears throat> that on David's shield, when he went to battle, he was a man of war, uh, could it have been that he branded, I mean, we're all looking, I just come up with, uh, uh, did some branding and made a logo for one of the businesses that I'm working with. Uh, that brand is what people recognize when he's out in battle, and you don't recognize one soldier from the next, wouldn't it be great to have something on them or on their shield or something to identify them? This is one of my guys. That's a plausible explanation. And that might be where we got the rumor of all this coming up, that it was the double D brand, if you will. If I was out in the Wild West, uh, you know, they used to brand their cattle, same thing, so they could tell my cattle from your cattle, because there wasn't any fences, they're all running together, guess what, we got to sort them out somehow. So that is one suggestion, and why so many uh, say that it's the shield of David, uh, or, or David's name is basically DD, you know, the double D brand, if you will. So the Star of David stands for God is our protection from all six sides. <clears throat> if you want to look at what's going on, now I've given you all the different things that, that say that it could be a pagan symbol, symbol. And we know that it has been used in occult practices. It has been used in all manner of abominations before the Lord our God. I don't doubt that at all because I know I've been taught and I've been told that the enemy comes to steal. What does he do real good? I mean, just take the rainbow, okay? To steal, to kill, and destroy. Now, if he can destroy God's people by taking their icons, taking everything that, it, that identifies that people, he will. So get over that part of it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, making excuses. I'm not saying that it has not been used. This symbol has been used in occult practices, period. We can't deny it, all right? You cannot say, no, 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 it hasn't been, but it has. I showed you that. So what do we do from now? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's what we've got to understand. Just because that star meant to the Hindus, the, the male-female aspect, doesn't mean that's what it means to me, okay? Here is some of the things that I found interesting in looking at the meaning. What does it mean to me? And these are the thoughts that I wrote down. God is our protection from all six sides, from above and beneath, from in front and behind, from left to right, God has me surrounded with his protection. It's a sign of the Sabbath. The core is the Sabbath. And then around those six days shall you do all your work and you shall rest on the seventh. The two triangles, one points to God and our relationship from us to God the other points from God coming to us. And it's that, that overlapping between them that you get into the core. God being the center in the 12 tribes around, which we'll get to. God is the center of Israel. The nation, not just Judah, but the, the true all 12 tribes the symbol of a people that have endured throughout time. The color blue and white shows the command, boy, this fly. Welcome to summertime, right? 
The color of blue and white shows the command of the tallit. You think about it. What is the command of the tzitzi when we when we put this thread? It says you'll take this white and you'll wrap it with a thread of blue. That's why I believe that that the Star of David is blue on a white background to remind us again of God's commandments, to remind us again that we've been called to be different. Historical dates that include the Star of David, how about way back in the Bar Kokhba revolution in 135, there were coins. Now, Kokhba means star. So was this his own coin that he put, boom, that's my coin, my star coin? Could be, could be identifying uh, as a nation after the revolution. I don't know, but we have got physical evidence of that. See Solomon, there are records of signet rings and seals that include the star. Now, again, you'll say, well, he picked that up from his pagan wives. And when they did that, when he married the Pharaoh's daughter, blah, 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 could be. I'm not going to dismiss it. I'm just saying that it was a part of identification of the, the nation here in the 14th century medieval European flags and a Prague community in Rome that identified Jewish or Hebrews with a star. Uh, Jewish printer logos in the 16th century, where they were identifying that this publication was from a Jewish author or maker. Uh, Vienna border markers, way back here in 1656, they had a cross on one side and a star of David on the other to identify the, the Jewish community and the Christian community. Uh, the first Zionist Congress adopted the Zionists there. Uh, those rabbis got together from the, the Russian contingency in, in uh, Zionist community, said that we wanna have something to identify us as a people. And, and make sure that we can have something to hold on to as our own. And that's where that was born out of in modern times. Uh, the French protests over military burials, they would uh, identify uh, French Jewish servicemen on their, on their tombstones with a star. Uh, and then, of course, the yellow badges in Nazi Germany that uh, identified Jewish people. So it's nothing new. And you can say, OK, that's really satanic. And yeah, it was. But we're going to look at something to consider, too. What happened when the tribes came out of Egypt? They turned back to their old gods. Can't deny it in scripture. When the southern kingdom came out of Babylon captivity, they had a different version of the Hebrew alphabet. The calendar was different. They renamed them. You know, that's where we get even. Guys, look, what is a Hebrew calendar doing with one month called Tammuz that we know is absolutely a reference to a pagan deity? Uh, things come out. They've got a Babylonian Talmud. They've got a calendar that's mixed up. They don't, they don't do the same things. And there's a lot of other things that came out of Babylon with them, like Rosh Hashanah was carried over from Babylon. That is not in scripture. It doesn't say that you'll have, uh, instead of being Feast of Trumpets, you'll call it Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. That's, that was a carryover from the Babylonian times. If you haven't heard that teaching, it's out there. Uh, we can get that to you on the fall feast. That was part of that. 
uh, the Northern Kingdom has its own junk traditions. You know, we came out, we're partly still in the diaspora from the Northern Kingdom, Samaria, and it was dispersed. Here, we get on more Christian things like Christmas and Easter, uh, the icons, the grottos, the stuff like that, all the, the Dagon fish hats and, and the wearing of the red and on and on. Sunday worship, yeah, pagan. Worshiping the sun god, come on, guys, you can't be that, that naive. I was going to use another word, but naive, you can't be. But that's what my pastors, oh, is it in the word of God or not? Okay. I'm going to quit standing on toes so hard. So is it good or bad? Let's get down to it. There's a ton of gray area around this and other subjects like it. So where do we draw the line? What do we do? We know that it was adapted over time. It was tradition. It was handed down. Nobody can really point to, well, this is where it started. This is why it started. This is how it started. and it comes forward from there. We can't do that because we have no idea. There are no records. Even the Jewish historians themselves have no idea where this star of David came from. It just kind of showed up. It's kind of like, I go back to Prophet Steve's got a great story about a, a newlywed couple that were in the kitchen Young lady was preparing a roast, and her husband watched her cut the ends off of the roast, right? And Steve tells us better. But cut the ends off the roast and then cook it. And the young man asked, why in the world do you do that? She said, well, that's the way grandma always did it. She always, whenever she cooked a roast, she cut the ends of the roast off. So the young man went to grandma and said, I got a question. I noticed Sally here, every time she cooks a roast, she cut the ends of the roast off. Why did she do that? And grandma said, well, that's easy. I didn't have a big pan. And when I got the roast, I had to trim the roast to fit in the pan. It wasn't a secret tradition. It wasn't anything like that. It was practical. I didn't have a big pan. I couldn't fit it all in, so I had to trim the roast. But you see there how things get handed down. And until we question, we never know the truth. It's good to question. We should be uh, searchers. We should, as it says in Thessalonians, test everything. I want you to test this, what I'm saying. We know, third point, that the enemy will counterfeit and steal whatever has been meant for good. And you can see it through everything from, from the rainbow to God only knows. Where does it stop? You know, the, the institution, the sacred institution of marriage. Now the enemy's trying to get it where you could marry your pet legally. Insane. You know, uh, I got to stop there. That'll go on to be a rant that'll get me kicked off of YouTube. The yellow star in Nazi Germany was a sign of humiliation, segregation, and hate. It has risen to a sign of life and overcoming. So in this, when you think about what's going on, in this, as we have adopted this as an emblem of Ephraim International Ministries, you see here that we have the menorah. We did adopt the menorah as the center. We go back to the temple. We go back to Torah as our root, as our center. If God said it, we do it. And that's where we're at with that. We can still see the overtone of the God to us and the God to and the man to God interchange, if you will. We see the protection of the Father. We see the blue on the white background 
to remember the commandments, remember the Torah. We see the 12 tribes all listed here with their colors as prescribed on their standards. This would be our standard as a nation, all 12 tribes, not just Judah, not just Benjamin, but all 12 tribes. And that's what we do. We circle it because we are in unity and united together. This is why we do this. It's not a satanic emblem to us, but it is one of life, one of freedom, one of regathering. So that's that's where we're at today. And uh, let me go ahead and escape here. Tell him I'll be right with him. He'll be out in a few minutes. Got somebody here that wants to uh, stop share. There we go. Hey, it was trying to do that all the time. Sorry about that. I got interrupted by by somebody. I should have shut the door. Um, you know what, guys? Let's go to prayer. Let's go ahead and close this thing. If you truly believe that this emblem in back of me is a satanic one, it's going to be hard to change your mind because you're going to look for that. You're drawn to that. You're looking for every evil in every corner, every crack, every crevice, and you will find it. And you're going to believe what you want to believe. If you truly believe that this emblem means something more, that we're taking what the enemy meant to steal, what the enemy meant for destruction, and turn it into a symbol of life and freedom and a way to turn back to God, then that's what we believe as well. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the revelation knowledge. I thank you for peace in this. Father, wherever anybody sits, wherever they stand on this, Father, bless them. Let them fully understand in their own heart. Deal with them individually. And Father, I thank you for the anointing. I thank you, Father, that you have given power to your children to overcome to bless. Now, Father, send your anointing. And I want this in a real tangible way that those who are listening to this would know that you would give a sign, a seal, something that would validate the words that came out, the words that were preached, Father. And if they are wrong, let them fall to the ground. But Father, if these words are right, and from you, as I believe they are, send your power and your anointing to heal, to deliver, to destroy the yoke of bondage, to give signs to those who would ask. Father, I praise you for it. Go forward now, heal and bless. There's somebody right now as we close, somebody um, in the, I'm here in the jejunum, <clears throat> which that is in technical terms, one of the segments of the small intestine. You've got what I think is an ulcer. You've got an issue there in your small intestine, it's very painful. Uh, could be colitis, uh, could be several things. Father, in the name of Yeshua, I curse the condition that's come in and I command a healing right now. Father, heal and restore, ease the pain, repair the breach, bring back to full function. 
Father, I thank you for it. I thank you for this one and others that will testify of your love and your mercy and your power. Yeshua's name, bless. If you need something right now, the power is out there. Use this as a sign. Grab a hold of it. Claim it as your own. Father, heal them now. Release the anointing, healing power. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right, folks, be blessed. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you did, for those that are watching it on social media, please like, subscribe to Ephraim International Ministry. You know all this stuff. We're, we're trying to get the word out to the world. Amen? Amen. Shalom until next week.